Out here in the Arizona desert, there is nothing more common than thorns, and nothing so rare as cooling shade. Today, this arid landscape will bake at about 110 degrees. It's a harsh world for humans and wildlife alike. To survive here, the Indians of the desert had to be careful students of all the ways other creatures adapted. They chose to fletch their arrows with feathers from desert hawks. They hoped it would make the arrows fly to the target swift and deadly as the hawk itself. The Indians would have known the strange habits of this particular hawk. But outside observers have always thought it was a lot like other hawks. A lone hunter, fierce, independent, a desert solitaire. They were wrong. The Harris hawk contradicts all the stereotypes. Here's a hawk that likes to hang out in crowds. A hawk where several adults band together to help out around the nest. It is, in fact, a social hawk. But the strangest thing is that Harris hawks also like to gang up for the kill. To these quail, the hawks must look like an airborne wolf pack. It's a twist on the old slogan, the family that prays together stays together. There's only one other bird of prey in the world that hunts in packs. So why has the Harris hawk evolved this extraordinary group behavior here in the American Southwest? Researchers have now begun to piece together this tantalizing puzzle. Among them is a University of Arizona ornithologist named Jim Dawson. If I could choose to be a desert animal, I'd clearly be a Harris hawk. They lead such spectacular lives. To have cooperation among hawks like this is fascinating, and the fact that uh, extra birds will help in a nest, they'll all cooperate together, maybe up to four or five birds will help ten young in the same nest. Uh, they hunt together, uh, much like a wolf pack. All those things make the Harris hawk a really interesting bird. In the Sonoran Desert, the spiny arms of the saguaro cactus often cradle a nest full of Harris hawks, like this one. These birds may look like a simple two-parent family, but caring for these four-day-old hatchlings is more than two parents by themselves can handle in the desert. They need other adults to help out. Elsewhere, 
Harris hawks don't appear to live in groups. Communal living seems to be a way of adapting to this particular habitat. A watchful hawk might seem at first to be working only for itself. A wood rat looks like easy game. The rat has spiked the entrance of its midden with thorns to discourage predators. The Harris hawk's long legs are ideal for just this situation. But the desert is brushy and full of hiding places, so the hawk also needs help from its friends. The others watch for the getaway, while the first hawk tries to flush the quarry. To the rat, the next prickly pair over looks like the only chance. The hawks don't have to be so reckless in pursuit. Because they're working together, they can afford to take their time. Carefully, the hawks move into position. It's a stakeout. The rat panics. And group hunting scores another small but vital triumph. Getting impaled on a cactus is a constant hazard of the hunt. One theory is that group hunting developed as a way to avoid getting stuck in the first place. A head-on collision with a cactus could be fatal. Other species are also working on strategies to survive among the thorns. For the cactus wren, the choya is a refuge. The thorns discourage hawks from carrying off the nest and young as a sort of picnic basket treat. To avoid the thorns altogether, some birds nest on the open ground. The mottled coloring is camouflage. But thorns aren't the only peril here. The Gila monster loves a breakfast of scrambled eggs. It's too big to chase off. Unlike any other lizard, it can also defend itself with venom. The mother bird will have to lay more eggs and take another chance in the boom or bust sweepstakes of the desert. But even the most venomous creatures take their chances here. Another hawk species also lives in this desert. The red-tailed hawk faces down its deadly prey on open ground. A bite from the diamondback rattler could easily kill it. With the grace and daring of a matador, the red tail tries to get the snake to strike at its wing feathers and expose its head. Hunting in a pack might be a safer strategy. But the red tail is a loner. 
it doesn't have that option. Back at the Harris Hawk nest, the deadliest enemy in the desert is making everyone miserable. The unrelenting heat. By late morning, it's too hot even to sit still in the bottom of the nest. Shade is so precious that this youngster nuzzles the cactus for relief. These 18-day-olds could easily die of dehydration. But the Harris hawk's long legs and tail prove surprisingly useful. Serving as a parasol is one of those humbling little roles a mother takes on for the love of her offspring. The Harris hawk has learned to fit in well among the cactus but the desert wasn't its original home. Harris hawks probably originated in Central and South America, where they're still common. They often live near rivers, and that's how they found their way north into the Arizona desert. As deserts go, this one is lush. It gets enough rain to support an abundance of plants and animals. But away from the rivers, there wasn't enough water for a thirsty Harris hawk until the 1930s. That's when livestock grazing came in. The cattle haven't adapted all that splendidly to life among the thorns. But new drinking ponds allowed the cattle to spread out into the desert, and the hawks followed. Along with other wildlife. Thirst brings all kinds of animals together at the cattle ponds an uneasy meeting place for prey and predator. This may be the day the antelope jackrabbit gets eaten by a gang of hawks. But quail are easier game when a Harris hawk happens to be hunting solo. A Harris hawk doesn't always need its group. In less hostile habitats, these birds typically hunt alone. But everything about the desert drives the Harris hawks together. Researchers trying to understand all this togetherness have never known for sure how the birds in a group are related. So they couldn't answer one big question. When they live in groups, are Harris hawk couples monogamous? Faithful to one mate until death. Dawson needed to capture the birds to get more precise information. It may look strange, but I found I could use a stuffed owl as bait. The great horned owl is the hawk's biggest enemy in the desert. When they see one, they attack with absolutely no hesitation. The only thing the hawk is thinking about is how to drive away the owl. It doesn't see Dawson's net until it's too late.
It's taken us years to develop techniques that don't stress the birds. I've handled more than 700 hawks without an injury. We capture a bird only once in its lifetime and aim to release it within 30 minutes. By marking them with leg bands, the research team can absolutely tell individuals apart in the field. But even this isn't enough to let Dawson prove whether or not these birds are monogamous. Immobilized in a gym sock, the bird gets a quick physical exam. From the blood sample, scientific alchemy reveals the bird's purified DNA. A geneticist made DNA fingerprints of Dawson's hawks. It's the exact technique used in human paternity disputes. So this technique is a real eye-opener in terms of who's mating with who and who's producing offspring in these groups. And as it turns out, it, it uh, disproved a lot of the ideas that I had prior to this uh, in terms of monogamy being the dominant mating system. DNA reveals the mating history of the group. With that information, Dawson can follow the birds into the field and begin to see how group living works. The family values in many groups turn out to be distinctly unconventional. For the first time, DNA fingerprinting has allowed Dawson to open up the secret life of nests like this one where the youngsters are now three weeks old. The group is vigilant. But hidden in this blind, Dawson can wait and watch for hours. He's found that Harris Hawk groups are flexible enough to try almost any mix of male and female. Some couples are, in effect, happily married and monogamous, as biologists always suspected. But on this nest, DNA fingerprinting showed that the youngsters come from two different mothers, sisters who mated with the same male. Other nests have one mother, but she mates with several males in the group. Harris hawks aren't locked into any single social system. Like human parents, they simply do whatever is necessary to raise their young in a changing world. One way the hawks adapt to the desert is by maintaining a territory. When an outsider like this trespasses, every member of the group goes on alert. The territory measures less than a square mile around the nest, so the group can't afford to tolerate poachers. Defending their turf will ultimately determine whether the hawks in this nest will eat or be eaten. For the hawks, the deadliest competitor is the great horned owl. It's the biggest and most abundant bird of prey in this desert. The owl covets the exact same nest sites as the hawk in the arms of the saguaro. But by night, 
the competition becomes far more sinister. The owl can pluck a young Harris hawk right out of the nest and devour it. I'm out there in the dark, and all of a sudden a great horned owl comes in. The hawks let out an alarm call, and there's a lot of rustling in the saguaro. In the morning, I'll search the area and typically find a pile of feathers where the owl ate the nestling. It's very sad when you become familiar with one of these young birds, and then it's gone. But there's no moralizing about it, really. It's just one of those things that happens here. The saguaro cactus is also home to the smallest owl in the world. It's a much more agreeable neighbor for the hawks. But to a moth or a beetle, even the elf owl must look like death incarnate. A hungry cottontail is enjoying the cool of the new morning, grazing on the desert forage. But this gang of hawks is out on the prowl. They're hungry, too. The rabbit is a brilliant escape artist. The hawks will have to work closely together to force it into a fatal error. The rabbit shakes off one hawk in the brush, but the others are right there to take up the pursuit. The group will share their catch. As in a hungry wolf pack, a little squabbling determines who gets to eat first. At the nest, the youngsters are two months old now. This giddy dance means they're ready to fly. Or anyway, wish they could. They stretch their wings, and you can almost hear one nudging the other. You go first. One sibling tumbles off into the thorny abyss. It's a struggle just to get back to the comforts of the nest. But for now, and for months to come, they can depend on their extended family.
The Harris Hawk has adapted brilliantly to the desert. But how will it fare as the desert changes? It doesn't look like much of a home for the Harris Hawk, but the city has sprawled out into the Hawk's world. Dawson often finds himself studying his birds in unlikely places, like metropolitan Tucson. He's outfitted some of the Hawks with lightweight radio transmitters. From a tall building, he can locate a bird on a lamppost five miles away. Radio tracking helps him figure out how the birds are learning to live with development, and sometimes how they die. In the city, birds often hunt from utility poles instead of saguaros. Electrocutions are the major cause of death. Well, there have been a number of situations where people have called the police. And so we're sitting out there watching the birds and the police show up, uh, expecting some kind of suspicious activity. A lot of people wonder what we're doing with the equipment. Are we conducting surveillances? The spotting scopes can look like guns from a distance. Generally, it's uh, very suspicious. At first, people were also suspicious of the hawks. They thought these desert predators might eat their cats and dogs, the way coyotes do. But hawks stick to unpopular prey, like wood rats. People are learning to regard Harris hawks as good neighbors. The hawks let out a sound when those coyotes are coming, and on, I want to kiss them because I can get all my dogs, I can get all my pets in, and I don't have to worry that anybody's going to, you know, be the coyote's dinner. <laughs> so now it's always, and they'd always do that sitting on the telephone pole. The hawks have a home here as long as I'm here. Hawks were very active earlier in the spring. You know, they're on a neighbor's roof over there, sitting up on a perch in a high spot, just <laughs> really? checking, hey, what's out there, you know? <laughs> like other neighborhood families, the hawks provide grist for gossip. Uh-huh. And we were out walking a couple of days ago, and uh, you could see them, their heads going up and... Oh, really? down well, in the nest, so I don't know if they you, have any babies in there or not, do they? We think they? they do. We think they oh, have young, right. uh, right. small young. Yes. The hawks are adapting, too. They've learned some of the small luxuries of living among people. There seems to be plenty of water, and as long as patches of desert also run through the development, the hawks thrive here. We are only beginning to understand how extraordinary these hawks really are. By learning to live in groups, they found a way to eke a living from this thorny world. Now they're getting used to people as well. They're such an adaptable bird. You think of all the changes they've come through. They've learned to live in groups. They've developed strategies for hunting among the thorns. They're getting used to highways and humans. It makes me think that with a little care and effort on our part, 
The Harris Hawk is going to be out here for a long time. For once, it's a real success story. <laughs>